Welcome to 360 Money Matters, where financial planners Billy and Andrew talk all things financial planning. This podcast aims to increase your knowledge and confidence with all things money. Each week, they will cover topics like wealth creation strategies, investment principles, creating passive income, paying off your debt faster, and much, much more, so you can live a life on your terms without limits. Hello and welcome back to another episode of 360 Money Matters Podcast. I'm Billy and I'm joined by my co-host. Andrew, good to be back for another podcast and we've got a special guest today, don't we, Billy? Andrew, very exciting. We've got our guests. We're talking, leading into the uh, property sort of theme that we've been talking about recently. So we thought it would be fitting to bring a mortgage broker into the fold and have a chat around mortgage brokers, what they do, sort of unpack that a little bit and get some value into our listeners around uh, how that can assist in terms of purchasing and transacting on a property. Absolutely. Absolutely. And who better to have along than the director of our mortgage breaking business? We've got Mish Bletcher. Mish, welcome. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Good to have you on to the podcast. So, I mean, Mish, tell us a bit about yourself. You're obviously a director of the mortgage breaking business. You started 360 Financial with Billy. So, for me, no introduction necessary. <laughs> but for our listeners, you're a... Uh, <laughs> A new member into the podcast. Yes. So uh, where do we start? Jenny, it's been a while, but yeah, we've been uh, running this broken arm of the business since day one. So we started the business just under 10 years ago now. Bit of background, was a BDM, was a broker for almost close to 15 years now. So So Mish, give us a bit of a rundown for those that don't know. What does a mortgage broker do? So Mortgage broker is someone who sits down with their clients to understand their needs and objectives to assist them with facilitating a loan. It'd be a pre-approval to purchase a home or refinancing to find a better interest rate or even restructuring their existing home loan needs. For example, if someone wants to take out equity from their home or purchase a car, renovate their home, or even go on a holiday, we facilitate in the process of actually getting them the finances. A broker will also ensure that they find their clients not just the best rate, which is what most people think that brokers do, but they also assist them with their needs, their goals, their objectives as to what type of loans they should get. For example, should you fix your loan? Should you keep it variable? Educate your clients along the way, how offset accounts work, giving them the basics and understandings of the process and how buying a home works, how refinancing works. One of the things, I mean, you touched on it briefly there, Mish. One of the things that I've always found interesting is I think conceptually and on a high level, people know what a mortgage broker does. I mean, ordinarily you go to a one bank and you get the product and the solution that that bank offers. That's pretty straightforward because you're talking directly with that bank. You go to a mortgage broker and they can expand that out and go to market and essentially give you the best rate that's suitable for your circumstances. But Mish, talk us through a little bit in terms of maybe some of the intangible stuff. I've always found when I've gone through this process, it's not just the product that I'm getting value from. Yeah, I'm going to get a great loan. It's going to be structured properly. I'm going to get a competitive rate. It's also the intangible part about feeling confident, having someone to rely on, having my hand held. What does that look like for you when you're working with clients on that process? Yeah, I mean, look... You're right. At the end of the day, clients come to a broker. It's very different to going directly to a branch. It's very different to applying for a loan online. Basically, the benefits of using a broker is the same reason you go to an accountant. You save yourself time, headaches. We look across 40 to 50 banks. I think there's 54 or 55 banks out there to look at and trying to find which one is the most suitable one for you. You know, It saves you a lot of time. Through the journey of the minute that you sit down with a client, it's educating them and understanding even the very, very basic things like how much is it going to cost for me to buy a house? A lot of people don't explain that there are other fees associated like you know, conveyancing and solicitor's costs. Because we're, when making a purchase, we're the first people there and we're the last people there as well. Yep. So we have to be there throughout the whole journey, whereas you know, a real estate agent will be there at the start and at the end. My conveyancer will just come or a solicitor will only come at the end. So we have to really facilitate the whole way through, whether it takes a pre-approval last three months, we have to extend it. We have to educate the clients, making sure what's the best structure for your home. No, absolutely. And it sounds like it's a pretty labor-intensive service. So how much does it cost? How does a mortgage broker get you remunerated? 
How does that process work, Mish? Not, not enough is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, fortunately for very different Australia than it is in many other places overseas, but for the Australian public, the way brokers get paid is via commission from the bank. So essentially, the bank pays us an upfront for doing the loan, seeing the client, processing it all the way to settlement, like I was saying before, which includes doing all the paperwork, the admin, the following up with the applications, with the banks, conveyances, real estate agent, etc. We also receive an on, a small ongoing trial, which is an ongoing fee from the bank so that we can service our clients appropriately. So in short, it doesn't actually cost anything for the clients out of pocket because the bank gives us a commission the same that they would pay someone that works there. So we just get paid an upfront commission and then ongoing a small trail along the way to make sure that when the clients have questions, we answer them accordingly if they need to increase their loan, et cetera. So I'm a bit biased from this perspective, but I'm going to drill down on it and have a bit of fun with it. So if it doesn't cost the client any more money and you're getting a personalized service, you're getting your hand held, you're getting somebody, an expert that's helping you with this from end to end, it's usually an emotionally driven event anyway, because it's such a big purchase. Why would anyone not use a mortgage broker and why would you go directly to your bank? Great question. We get asked that a lot. What differentiates you to the bank? What differentiates you to applying online? Some people find it traditionally, we're going from branches where people walk into a branch, they go get their credit cards there, they go get their savings accounts there, they get their pension there, they get everything is done through there. So there's that element of, there's a strong element of trust with the banks. Over the last sort of 10, 15 years, you found that the market share between brokers and the banks and the online banks has shifted dramatically to the point where I don't quote me on it, but I believe 60 to 70 percent of that 70 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Market share through brokers these days. And I think it's just a knowledge gap in the public. I think the broker industry as a whole could probably be doing a little bit more to advertise to why not see a broker just like that's unbiased towards it. Because if you go to a branch and it's nothing against the banks directly, but if you go to a branch, I'm not going to name any banks because it's the same with every single one. They can only provide you their suite of products. And each bank has about five to 10 different types of loan products. Fortunately, because we only do the research end to end, but we also do so many loans every year. I mean, as a firm, as Billy, you're well aware, we write approximately $100, $150 million worth of loans per annum. So we're across the scope of different advice pieces and different interest rates as they move, as they change. We've got process systems in place to make sure that we can look across the board quite quickly and do it efficiently. Yeah. And you sort of touched on a point there. I'd also really like to drill down on. You mentioned unbiased. You're not incentivized in any way to recommend one bank over another, or is it certain brokers have preferred banks that they deal with, or what's or different commission structures? Yeah, or different commission structures. How does that work? Yeah, look, that's a great question. So, as you both know, coming from a financial planning background, it's uh, very heavily uh, compliance driven. We have best to say the least. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of admin, a lot of compliance. We get ordered to make sure that we're on track to make sure we give the right advice across the board constantly. So for us, I mean, the commission structures varies from bank to bank, like Billy was saying. Unfortunately or unfortunately, it's very slightly different. So it's, we're talking about 0.05 to 0.1 commission difference between all the banks, right? Which is generally about a couple hundred bucks an upfront commission. So it's it's insignificant. It's very insignificant. But however, financial planning is probably a bit ahead of our industry in that regard, ahead of the broking industry where best interest duty, reasonable base of advice has been around for 10 plus years. Whereas with broking, it's only a recent thing that's come in. So we have to abide by the code of ethics, which is called best interest duty, which is great that it's come into the broking world because it makes it a lot more ethical. Brokers have to actually abide by this best interest duty, meaning that we have to ensure that we have to show proof and paperwork that we've met the client's goals and objectives and the client's best interest with our home loan recommendations. So there's very little incentive because if anything at all for a broker to break the code, we could lose our licenses by uh, giving bad advice. There's a big... And all for the sake of what, a couple of hundred dollars, it's ultimately a fairly insignificant amount in terms of this is the thing i think there's a massive misconception around here that a particular broker or a broker in general will swing a loan towards a particular lender because they're going to get more commission but 
One, there's no real difference in terms of remuneration from what you're telling us. And the compliance regime that sits behind this forces us as brokers to make sure that we're recommending a product that's appropriate for our client that meets their needs and it's in their best interest. So you can't do that even if you wanted to. For sure, Billy. I mean, I've spoken to many brokers over the past 10, 15 years, and I don't think I've met any that favor banks based on commissions. You'll find that when brokers talk to industry bodies and their aggregators about their issues, it's very little to do with commission, and it's more about they'll favor a bank if it's easy to service, if their speed of delivery is good, if they've got good internet banking and phone applications, because that's what the clients want. It's all the intangible things that you're trying to give the client for their own interest anyway. For sure. I mean, look, I'm not going to name and shame or anything like that, but we have clients that will not move from certain banks. I know that because the interface is so good. They appreciate the phone and application, the internet banking so much more because barely anyone goes to branches anymore. Yeah. And for the sake of even if it's 0.1 or 0.2% higher, some clients, they prefer that because it works for them. It's easy to use. When they travel, it's easy to transfer money. It's easy to take the money out of the offset account with ease. If they need to make changes, it's a phone call that I have to be on wait for. And now certain banks are better than others in that regard. And we discuss this with the clients when we talk about is it the best interest rate? Because the best interest rate is very easy for us to get because we've got access to every single product, every single bank. But like you said, Andrew, it's all the intangibles is what's more important to you. Yeah. One of the other things too that sort of touches on that, that I'm sort of experiencing at the moment anyway, brokers aren't necessarily picking a particular bank for a particular reason, as in because they favor them or what have you. And the instance that I'm going through At the moment, I'm going through a pre-approval process and because of the business and bits and pieces, I've got a fairly complicated financial structure. So that process there, we've needed to have found a bank from a policy perspective that actually suits my circumstances as well. So because of just the nature of sort of my financial makeup, I don't necessarily have as much flexibility as possible to go to market to be able to talk to every lender like a mortgage broker would ordinarily do. So I'm relying on a mortgage broker's knowledge about, hey, which bank, which lender will actually, whose policy will fit the circumstances that I've got. So that's more so about which one is going to be the right fit or what bank is going to be the right fit for me and vice versa, as opposed to, hey, what's the cheapest interest rate or who's got the best online banking? Because some of those things, from my perspective, are kind of down the list because I need to find somebody that actually will look at me and my financial circumstances just based on the complexity of it. So I don't think that can be downplayed either. Policy plays such a large part in being able to place a client. And from a broker's perspective, you're in such a strong position because you know policy, the different banks, the flavor of the people that they're looking at. Whereas if I just went to my local branch, I've got no idea whether or not they're actually going to work for my circumstances. Yeah, for sure, Billy. And you raise a really valid point when it comes to especially self-employed or ones that have a somewhat complicated structure. When I mean complicated, it doesn't even have to be what financial advisors wouldn't consider complicated, but even having a trust, for example, a family trust. You don't have to own your own business to have a family trust. As soon as you add different layers into your financial situation, it does get more complicated. So for example, if you go direct to the bank or online, Every single area of the business has its place. I'm not downplaying that it's better to go to one or the other, but as soon as there's things that can get a bit more complicated, especially with self-employed, even between the big four banks, they vary in policy so much. And their policies shift and change as well. So being across what was okay six months ago may not necessarily be okay in six months later. So 100%. I tell our clients this, policy changes, but like interest rates change. For example, we had a pre-approval for a client, took them six months to buy. And when they purchased, I said, listen, we we're going to go with that particular bank, do a 60-day settlement. It'll give me enough time to find, to look across the board again. And that way we ended up switching banks. Even though we had a pre-approval with one bank, we didn't end up going with that bank because their interest rates weren't as good at that time, at that point in time. So, because it took a little bit longer, interest rates shift, different banks, more business, more than others, more cost of funding, whatever it is. So just changing tact a bit, let's try and demystify some of the things that sort of we come across with the questions with clients around what it takes in order to get a home loan 
Andrew, take us through what are some of the things that we hear from clients when we're having that conversation with them? Yeah, I mean, look, one of the common things, especially when you're talking to first home buyers or you're talking to people that have never purchased property or taken out a mortgage beforehand, one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, do I need to take out a credit card? Do I need to start taking on debt or start doing something and paying it back regularly in order to build the credit file and build the credit score? Is that a thing? So I get this question all the time. We get it all the time. I hear it when I'm out at a barbecue or whatever, people always ask that question. But unfortunately, that's it, or fortunately, it's a bit of a myth, all right? No bank or lender likes seeing you have a credit card or a car loan, for example, as it will impact your ability to maximize your borrowing and your serviceability best thing to do is not take out any debt that could impact your financial situation. Yeah, I'm just saying from a bank's point of view, when we're going to borrow and they see a thousand bucks a month repayment on your car loan, that goes against you. When they see your credit card, and you gotta remember, banks look at the credit card limit, not at the balance. They don't care about your balance within reason, but if you're late on your credit card payment, that goes into your credit history, actually does the opposite. Yeah. And the best thing to do is, like I said, not take any debt. For example, paying a credit card will incur significant fees. It's usually around 20%. So that's to do to ensure you pay all your phone bills on time or your utilities bills on time. Or any service provider, don't be late on those bills because inevitably, they will never build your credit score and ensure it stays strong. Taking out credit cards and other car loans will actually does the opposite. So every time you apply for a credit card, people don't realize even if they apply online so they can get those extra bonus points there's frequent fly points, whatever it is, it's another credit inquiry. It goes against your credit. I think it's just thinking through this and we're big advocates of making sure that we're managing our, our consumer debt and being careful with credit cards and the like. So it's sort of no different to what we talk to clients about. But I think it's just really good marketing that that myth has managed to make its way out and people think about that. I don't know if it's a US thing. I've heard no. maybe, in the, well, maybe that's just another myth that's uh, floating yeah, around. We've got clients know. in the US. It's not. Uh, <laughs> it's not. I don't know which country it is, but as a credit company, credit card company sounds like great advertising. Yeah. So. That's exactly right. Mish, tell us, what about genuine savings and what are we usually finding that clients are needing as a deposit to have saved up? What does that look like in terms of some of the stuff that we're seeing at the moment? Yeah. So depending on how much deposit you have, but generally speaking to banks, but generally banks like to see at least 5% genuine savings for at least three months, right? For those who are listening and don't know what genuine savings means, I get it, we get that question a lot. It simply means money you have saved up over time, especially important for those who have less than 20% deposit, as mortgage insurers can be quite strict around that. So if you have 20% deposit, you won't have to pay for mortgage insurance. That will either go, mortgage insurance will either go on top of your loan or you can pay it out of your own pocket, but Banks and lenders often don't mind it as long as it meets their credit policy or their lending policy. So just got to make sure that you have at least three months, 5% of the purchase price for at least three months in your bank account. So the banks are wanting to see what save, a pattern of savings history because that gives them an indication of, I guess, client conduct. And if you can demonstrate that and you're consistent then that leans more towards being able to service an ongoing liability and there's some consistency there. So in other words, save the money in your account and don't take out a credit card to build your, yeah. <laughs> your credit yeah. score. Look, a lot of people don't know, but you're paying rent, that can often be classified as genuine savings as well. Because if you're paying rent and you're buying an owner occupier home to live in, you stop paying rent here. You start paying mortgage repayments, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So the banks do understand that banks are lenient in many ways. A lot of people think that banks and lenders are always there to reject you. Brokers sometimes get a lot of brokers call me, not just from our firm, but from other firms going, why is this deal not going ahead or what's going on, et cetera, because I used to mentor a lot of brokers back in the day, a long time ago, but it's usually the way the deal's structured. Go to the right bank and the credit helps you. They're not there to reject the loan. Yeah. Talk us through some of the options, that the way that we can structure a loan fixed versus variable, a combination of both, principal and interest, interest only. How do we land on some of these things when we're having a conversation with the client? What does that look like? Yeah, I can go on and on about this for a long time. But so basically, uh, fixed rates are exactly as the name suggests. I might just explain what fixed rates, variable rates are. 
principal interest yeah, interest only. You can fix a loan for between one to five years. You used to be able to do 10 years back in the day. Now it's gone down to a maximum of five. Interest rates vary depending on the time frame that you fix it from bank to bank. It varies. Fixing a loan ensures that your repayments are exactly the same for the duration of the fixed period until it matures, which will then turn into a variable rate. However, people often need to be careful when fixing a loan, especially if you're planning on making extra repayments because a lot of people don't know and realize that the bank limits you to only make an extra of 10 grand extra repayments on your mortgage if it's fixed. Some banks are 15, obviously generalizing here, but you can get penalized or they won't let you do it if you pay more than 10 grand a year. So when you're talking about a loan structure, you got to make sure that or the broker needs to make sure they understand what the client's needs are, if they're going to be able to keep saving after they get a loan, how much are they going to save? Sort of balance it out between the maturity of the fixed rate and the variable portion, because with the variable, you can actually utilize an offset account or a redraw facility to save further money. Even if the interest rate's a little bit higher on the variable, the overall picture is still cheaper. So getting that, it sounds like getting that balance right between, I guess, certainty around the the interest rate not moving, certainty around what your cash flow is going to do, and if you want to make accelerated debt repayments sort of leading one way or the other because you can't do that or there's some restrictions doing that with a fixed rate by the sounds of it. When we're talking to people about, I guess, debt reduction strategies, that's really crucial because you need to work within those parameters because if you go one way too far and that doesn't suit your strategy, you can really back yourself into a corner. Yeah. The amount of times that I've sat down with a client and a part of the financial planning strategy is the debt reduction strategy and they've got a fixed home loan for two years and can't make any additional repayments towards it, it can be detrimental in making sure that you're taking the right steps and receiving the right advice at the very beginning of the process is imperative because the implications of trying to fix it up or trying to Sorry, I was trying to say fix the scenario, but going to get confused with the fixed rate, but trying to unwind that position and break the fixed rate can be an expensive exercise. So you want to make sure that it's structured correctly from the beginning. Yeah, that's right, Andrew. And again, that's part of, I guess, that's the benefit of using a broker. And depending on the broker, depending on how deep they go with the client's understanding of it all but we have clients that i know they're going to be selling that place that they're buying for two or three or four years so it's important to factor in the fact that well we probably shouldn't fix it in case you decide to sell it earlier because you could incur fixed break costs so we'll work out strategies as to what's the best overall position it's not just about the rates because like i said before getting the lowest rates the easiest one for us and that's probably the entry route for most clients. They come to a broker because they're like, oh, yeah, I want the best rate, but they end up leaving with a lot more value than just that interest rate saving, which can't be downplayed. I mean, certainly benefit with negotiating rates and getting better rates for clients, but there's a whole lot more that underpins it when you're talking about uh, the value of a mortgage broker, at least in my opinion. Absolutely. I mean, I'll give you an example of where rate doesn't matter. Because I've had this phone call this morning on the way to this podcast, actually. To our recording studio. Yeah. <laughs> In the boardroom. So I had a client. She's a first home buyer. The loan is 500000 She said, Mish, I know we're um, fixing the loan. The interest rate's low. She said, however, Dad decided to give me $100,000. Do I put it as deposit? Do I put it into the loan, which is the loan? Do I have an offset account? I said, well, this changes. Good problem to have. (laughs) Well, I hope you advised her that he can adopt me. If that's the case, if he's just handing out 100K here and there, if he's looking for any additional children, I'll uh, I'll put my hand up. That's for sure. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Well, yeah, certainly has a good dad. So essentially, we have to change the loan structure. Now, the interest rate on the fixed loan happens to be 1.89%. So she's got cracker interest rate. Now, the thing is, is now should we make the loan instead of $500,000 fixed? Now we have to change it. Now we're either going to do it somewhere, and I've got to have a further discussion because I only had a quick conversation with her, is it's likely going to be three hundred and fifty dollars or 400000 that will be fixed and the other hundred will be variable because with a variable portion, you can't offset a fixed rate. You can only offset a variable with most banks. Some banks do allow you, and I'm generalizing, but this majority of the time, right? So we're going to have 
$500,000 loan, $400,000 fixed, 100,000 variable. In that 100,000, we're gonna have 100K sitting there in an offset account that you can use whenever you want, you can withdraw whenever you want, you can use it for renovations, whatever it is you want, but you're not paying interest on that 100K. So it saves it, even though the interest rate is 2.56% on the variable, if it was all on fixed, she'll pay significantly more, even though the interest rate's higher. Yeah, and I guess that's probably a good conduit. I've just been jotting down some numbers here in terms of the financial benefit. Just to, I've put some average numbers down here. Half a million dollar loan, 30 year term. On a 3% interest rate, you'll pay in interest over the life of that loan, $258,000 in interest. If you can work with a mortgage broker who's basically on top of their game, if you save half a percent, over that same scenario, you're paying $211,000 in interest, which is a saving over the life of the loan of $47,000. Now that's huge. I mean, we're all about wealth creation, but another way of creating wealth is obviously paying less ex expenses and in terms of interest. But the numbers, and obviously as you go up in terms of your loan amount, as you go up in terms of your interest rate, that divide gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So from a numbers perspective, getting the strategy right, getting the structure right, you're talking tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in terms of an absolute saving if you're doing it properly and getting advice. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, I mean, I don't know, maybe for people in my generation, probably not for people in your generation, Billy, but... <laughs> Billy's had to do that a number of times. I've cracked this joke a few, but I feel like I have to do that every podcast. <laughs> The truth is I do look younger than you, Andrew, so <laughs> go figure. Maybe, know, it's it's, the, maybe it's the beard. I think it is the beard. <laughs> but, I mean, for some people, going into the bank and having a branch is, is a really important thing. For other people, I mean, I can't personally remember the last time that I've gone into a branch. And so I having think a, of anything worse. Yeah, exactly. And so having a great interest rate without having the ability to or not needing the ability to go into a branch is important. And especially when you're putting those numbers together of an interest rate or, or an interest saving of money in your bank account, you're talking 48 grand over the life alone. That's huge. So I think that there's certainly a lot of value to be added and there's certainly a lot of complexity in this area and making sure that you're aligning yourself with the right team around you and you've got the right mortgage broker to be able to structure the loan and provide advice around the right type of loan for your personal situation is really important. Driving home the advice piece, Andrew, always we're huge advocates of it. We talk about it all the time. And just with those numbers and some of the things that we had identified, hopefully that, uh, that gives our listeners a really good indication of what a mortgage broker does, where the value comes from, the fact that there's no remuneration or no fee that changes hands from the client's perspective. It's all done in the background. Obviously, I'm a big advocate of it, but it's a no-brainer in my perspective. And every time I've gone through that process, I'm using a mortgage broker consistently all the time. So hopefully, we've given our listeners something to think about, a little bit of value, a little bit of uh, deeper insight into mortgage broking in the world of uh, residential home loans and how that works. So hopefully, we've created some value for them. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much for coming on, Mish. It's great to have you in our recording studio and be on the podcast with us. It's really been a pleasure been great to be here. And to our listeners, as always, if you've got any questions about anything that we've spoken about, if you want to reach out, feel free. Contact details are in the show notes and we'll catch you on the next one. Looking forward to jumping on the next podcast. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening today. If you have any questions on what we've talked about or would like to have a chat about your money journey, visit us at 360fs.com.au. Just a reminder to our listeners that the information contained in this podcast is general in nature and it is not intended as personal recommendations for the audience. Please consider whether the information suits your circumstances before acting on it. This information is provided by Billy Amaritas and Andrew Nicolaou of 360 Financial Strategist Proprietary Limited, authorised representatives and credit representatives of AMP Financial Planning.